So first, I'd like to contextualize the film a little bit uh, by giving you the definition of autism and kind of walking through some fun facts about it for those of you that may not know. I know we have a couple autistic individuals in this chat now, but I think that some of this information would be helpful for the overall picture. So first of all, what is autism? Autism spectrum disorder or ASD is a developmental disability caused by differences in the brain. And these differences can manifest in a ton of different ways and they manifest differently in different people. So some of these can be behavior differences, communication, interaction, and even learning. And the abilities of autistic people vary significantly. So some of us need a lot of help in our daily lives and others like myself can work and live with little to no support. And I really love the picture on the right because it dispels a lot of myths that people believe about ASD and what it means. So a lot of people think of autism spectrum disorder, which I'll hereby refer to as ASD, as a gradient from less autistic to more autistic, from mild to severe, or um, from high functioning to low functioning. And a lot of us in the community kind of want to re remove these adjectives from our vocabulary because it doesn't really capture the full breadth of what ASD looks like. So instead of looking at the image on the top, which is more of a gradient, we like to think of it as more of a color wheel, like what's on the bottom. And this can look different for everybody. You meet one autistic person, you've simply done that. You've met one autistic person because it affects everybody differently. So using myself as an example, I'm not so much affected on the language and communication side of things, I have very low support needs there. But I have high support needs when it comes to sensory input. My sensory needs are very high. So I can't go to a concert without heavy duty ear protection. Um, I can't wear certain fabrics. I can't wear wool because it's too itchy and it's too much sensory stimulation. I can't wear bracelets. I can't have tags on the inside of my clothing and I can't wear socks that constrict my ankles because it drives me crazy. And it actually makes it a lot more difficult for me to go about my daily life, just the the day to day stuff like self care and things like that. So when I when I moderate that sensory input, it makes it a lot easier for me to fit in in society. So we of course have to go over autism in media. That's very important, especially since we just watched a film about it. So I have a question for you all: What do these people on the right? have in common. And for those of you that aren't cinephiles like myself, the top is a still from Rain Man, the middle is from the Netflix show Atypical, and on the bottom we have Freddie Highmore in The Good Doctor, which is a TV show based on a Korean drama of the same name. So does anyone have any guesses? You can put it in the chat. So basically, if no one has any guesses, I can tell you. The answer is that these are all white men. And this is really, really important because this is how most media featuring autistic folks portrays our community. White male savants with profound communication and differences. While some may present like this, it does not reflect the full ASD spectrum. And why is this important? Because it, it manifests differently, autism in women and AFAB people. So for those of you who don't know, um, oh, I see. Yes, these are, all, these are all characters that are portrayed as autistic as well. So AFAB people, quick definition, assigned female at birth. The majority of autism research is done on white boys excluding AFAB folks and people of color from the narrative and limiting access to support services for marginalized groups. 80% of females remain undiagnosed at age 18, which has serious consequences for the mental health of young women. And the ratio of males to females with ASD is generally quoted as four to one. 
but the proportion of females whose ASD diagnosis is missed is unknown. So you basically have this giant feedback loop, right? Not just in media and what we're seeing in movies and TV, but also in the medical system and by extension, the research that goes into the medical system. So it's really important that we that we start conversations about this. Um, these these uh, structural biases lead to a lot of assumptions. One of them being that autistic people are overwhelmingly men and boys, but rarely women and girls. The correct part of that is that there are actually many women, girls, and non-binary people on the autism spectrum, but we all present differently. And this is important because stereotypes about who can be autistic means many autistic women are misdiagnosed, they struggle to get a diagnosis, or they receive a diagnosis late in life. And this limits access to support services. So autistic women might seem to have fewer social difficulties than autistic men and boys. And this could be because they are more likely to mask their autistic traits. That's definitely how I've gone about my life. Being part of a friend group, having socially normalized special interests, or high academic achievements in school are all factors that can mask difficulties in other areas. And so a really common um, manifestation of ASD would be repetitive behaviors or hyper-focused interests. And in boys, typically this would manifest as something like rocking back and forth or an obsession or a hyper-focus on trains. Whereas in girls, it might be twirling hair or something like the Twilight Saga. I can attest that when I was growing up, all of the little girls were talking about the Twilight Saga, so it wouldn't have been out of the ordinary for me to be talking your ear off about that. It was normalized because one of my hyper focuses and special interests is pop culture, media, and cinema. So I'd love to uh, end this section with a quote from the author Devin Price, who wrote Unmasking Autism. And if you want more of a nuanced take, on the autistic experience, he's a great resource uh, to pick up and read. So autistic women aren't overlooked because their symptoms are milder. Even women with really classically autistic behaviors may elude diagnoses for years, simply because they are women and their experiences are taken less seriously by professionals than a man's would be. Additionally, not everyone who has their autis autism ignored and downplayed is female. Many men and non-binary people have their autism erased too. To call the stealthy, more socially camouflaged form of autism a female version of the disorder is to indicate that masking is a phenomenon of gender or even of assigned sex at birth rather than a much broader phenomenon of social exclusion. Women don't have milder autism because of their biology. People who are marginalized have their autism ignored because of their peripheral status in society. And so what I've been trying to do through releasing Galoot and going on this whole journey, a lot of these film screenings that I do are also accompanied by talks. And it's sort of opening up the conversation to a lot of these facts that most people know nothing about. And it's important that we talk about this because this is how we enact change. We bring attention to the issue and then hopefully can make structural changes from there within the medical system and by extension, the media. So I'd also like to point out that I can only speak from my own experience in order to illuminate a side of the autism spectrum that's rarely reflected in our media today. And this is why I chose to create Galoot, to immerse people directly in my experience as an autistic woman from a sensory perspective and to broaden people's perspectives of what autism looks, feels, and sounds like. So let's talk a little bit about the inspiration for Galoot. First of all, the costume was designed, constructed, and performed by my sister, Brenna Lever. And she was kind of the best choice for this role because she grew up watching me and how my symptoms affected me. And she also had access to a lot of resources. At the time, I was doing a lot of uh, drawings obsessively. When I was around four years old and my mom started bringing me to doctors to, to find out what was up. And 
she saw a lot of space motifs in, in a lot of the uh, drawings that I was doing. So we wanted to make Galoot as a sort of avatar for myself. And despite being relatively socially adept, I definitely felt a certain sense of, of alienation, of just being different, also of being clumsy and feeling out of place. Um, and so Galoot's size was informed by that. I also had a lot of hand flapping behaviors, which is why we chose not only to remove the arms entirely, but to give her hands for feet. And we also made those little appendages above her eyes as a metaphor for distraction. So anytime things get a little bit too intense for Galoot, she covers up her eyes with her appendages. And then we also went through Joanne's fabric together, my sister and I, and she had me touch all the different types of fabric and whichever fabrics I gravitated to the most, whichever ones felt nicest on my skin were the eventual choices that she made for the construction of the Galoot costume. And then also the little white shapes that Galoot is spewing out is really a metaphor for creativity and also not really having a lot of control with a lot of symptoms that present externally and how people perceive you when you're kind of letting that fly. So at the same time, I was also, uh, while I was hand flapping, I had a lot of dictation. So I would be just saying words. What One of my main obsessions is, is language and the beauty of language. And at that time, it was just a, a mishmash, a soup of language. And my parents wrote down everything I was saying at the time when I was starting to show my symptoms. And they kept all of that upstairs in the attic with all my drawings. And when I got this residency, I was going through that stuff to look for inspiration. And it was just a trove of, of information and stuff. And so all of the stuff that you hear is real poetry that came out of my mouth at the time and uh, unedited, unfiltered. So that's all, it, everything that you see in here is stuff that was present in the drawings and the poetry. These are some of the drawings that inspired it and we mounted them on foam core and put them up in the beginning of the gallery. So when you walk into the immersive exhibition, you see the inspiration first and then you walk into Galoot's world and can really experience it from there. Okay, so a lot of my symbolism, as you've probably gathered, uh, is sensory. So I divided the film into three sections, sight, touch, and sound. For the first section, it was the red dancer for sight, the yellow dancer for touch, and the blue dancer for sound. And I would let them kind of improvise and do their own thing with a few key elements to really bring out those specific senses. And it was really about creating an arc that cycled between peace and sensory overwhelm. Um, a great example of the visual metaphors we used would be in the touch section, when it's kind of showing the, the differences between good touch and bad touch. So things that, that I dislike touching would be like, would feel like a cactus on my skin or wet grainy mud whereas good things like my dog Blinky or um, a red shiny very smooth ribbon or cotton balls and those can be very common and then with the dancers I really wanted to further um, emphasize that feeling of isolation and loneliness that Galoot feels by removing all of the expressions of the dancer so that she couldn't read anything but their body language. Um, and so I put them in these body suits and let them do their thing. And they were so, so amazing. It was wonderful to work with them. So let's talk about the process of filmmaking a little bit. First of all, we have the pre-production process, which unfortunately I had to do twice because our first day of filming turned out to be the day that COVID shut everything down. So I had to rebook all of our dancers because our original dancers fled New York City and moved back to their home states. So I ended up going out east uh, on Long Island to where I grew up and there were some really talented local high schoolers and I used the three of them to cast the dancers. And then I had to do all of the work again and I had a lot of months as we all did of downtime. And I did 63 drawings 
which is the storyboarding process. And you draw what you want to see on screen and then budgeted for everything else and made the location rentals, the meal plan, the equipment rentals. And then we went into production, which was about four days. And we shot the project with the cast and crew and we got all 63 images that we wanted to get. And I budgeted extra time for us to get a little bit more just so that we would have options to cut to during the editing process. You always want more. Then for post-production, we edited everything together that we captured. And that was really fun for me. I love the editing process. Then from there, I collaborated with um, my boyfriend, who's also a composer, and he wrote the music. I helped a little bit with that. I also sang for the, the choral stuff, and we laid that as a bed underneath everything that was happening. Then we reconstructed all of the sets that you see in the film in the gallery space itself. We had a little opening, and then I sent the film itself to relevant parties and applied to film festivals and started taking the loot around the world. It was super fun and an extremely rewarding experience. So this is an example of one of the drawings that I did for the storyboarding process. And as you can see here, it's not 100% one-to-one, but it's pretty close. Then we would execute exactly what was in the drawing. That's Xavier there. And that is also our set without all of the lights dimmed. And what we did is we hung a heavy duty duvetine black fabric in the back, poked Christmas lights through, and then made these white forms that are reminiscent of the game Jax, if you've ever played that as a kid. We really wanted the sense of childlike naivete, and that's what we got. And then uh, for the large space sequences, we did video effects for everything above that. We turned down the lights and then just put artificial stars up there in the editing process afterwards. This is Brenna getting suited up as Galoot. And on the first day, it was really just a construction day. We pre-lit most of our stuff. We had a really, really solid plan, which is what allowed us to move so fast, even though our crew was pretty small. Um, so that's Brenna hot gluing one of the, the lighting fixtures there. And then on the right, she's getting suited up as Galoot. And that's her fully suited up. And as I said before, um, yeah, she, she doesn't have any arms, so she fell down a lot, unfortunately. But don't worry, we did pick her up. And then when we did close-up shots, which are very, very close in on just Galoot's face, Brenna would mount the Galoot head on a light stand and would hide underneath and puppeteer from beneath. She also had someone else hiding behind her. This is what it looked like when she was actually puppeteering in real time. And I would stand behind this monitor that you see here and check frame. And what that basically means is that I see everything that the camera is seeing. And if there's anything that looks a little weird, I give certain adjustments to crew members. They make those adjustments and then we press record and we go for it. And this is our cast and crew. There were only nine of us, but it was a really rewarding and wonderful set and nobody got sick, thank God. <laughs> then after that, a few months later, after the editing process, we came in and reconstructed the entire set again within the gallery space. And this was to be up for a month total, so it had to be pretty sturdy. This is what it looked like finally when we mounted the duvetine to the walls. And uh, that stuff collects dust like you wouldn't believe. So we had to go through with a mini vacuum and vacuum everything. And then this is what it looks like fully done. We mounted Galoot on the right and we had the video playing on a loop in the back. And this is us at a film festival. That's Brenna, AKA Galoot on the right. And that's Xavier on the left. He's the composer.